takes a sack. The throw. What a catch. Touchdown. Oh, my. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the sixth episode of 100 Years in the NFL, A Historical Journey. I am your host, Alex Chris. I hope all of you have enjoyed our first four videos that we have done so far of the AFC East covering the 1964 Bills, the 1968 Jets, the 1972 Dolphins, and of course the 2016 Patriots in our last video. Today we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with the AFC North Division here. Our first team we're going to go ahead and take a look at here is the 1948 Cleveland Browns and their perfect season in the All-American Football Conference during their 48 season campaign. Now before though I um, talk a little bit about their um, players and their statistics here. I want to give you a little bit of history of the All-American Football Conference before we delve into this a little bit more. So really right after World War II in 1946, the All-American Football Conference was founded, and this was a league that only remained for four years. It lasted from 1946 to 1949. There were eight teams in the AAFC during those four years, and at the end of the league in 1949 and 1950, three of those AAFC teams actually then went to the National Football League. Only two of those teams, though, actually remain in the NFL today. The one is, of course, the Cleveland Browns, as we're going to talk about today. The second team, actually, is the San Francisco 49ers, and we're going to get actually into that um, when we talk about their schedule a little bit here, because both the Browns and the 49ers were really two great teams in the four years of the All-American Football Conference. However, the Cleveland Browns, though, won all four AAFC championship games. But just to signal the importance of how well the Browns and the 49ers were in the AAFC, it really kind of helped step up their game once they became charter members of the National Football League once in 1950. NFL season began so really a really interesting journey for both those teams here but of course we're going to be focusing more on the Cleveland Browns here in 1948 now similar though like I said as to the 1972 Miami Dolphins the 1948 Browns also accomplished a perfect season in the AAFC and interestingly enough actually their perfect season in 1948 it's recognized by the Pro Football Hall of Fame but it's not recognized by the NFL themselves as being the perfect season that everybody remembers. A lot of people talk about the 1972 Dolphins' perfect season that year, but of course the 1948 Browns had their perfect season in the AAFC, and you could kind of maybe speculate that some people say that because of those two seasons they had really pedestrian, easy schedules to really go through it, but as we're going to look through the Cleveland Browns schedule later, they really faced a really interesting streak right at the end of the season, and I'm going to get into that when we talk about their schedule later. So right before, though, we get talk about some of their um, key players and statistics of the 1948 Browns, I want to um, read you a little bit of um, an interesting um, historical backlogging to um, how the 48 Browns came of age and really how the AAFC was founded in the early days. So just sit back and uh, listen to this really interesting um, thing that I'm about to read you here for, about the 1948 Cleveland Browns and how they really came of age in the AAFC. So in 1945, though, the city of Cleveland celebrated their first professional championship in over two decades after the Cleveland Rams won the 1945 NFL championship game over the Washington Redskins. Now here's the interesting story about that is because the Cleveland Rams were there but then the next season after that though the Cleveland Rams owner who was Dan Reeves at the time he actually then moved his franchise to Los Angeles just four weeks after winning that 1945 NFL championship game and really left Cleveland without a professional football team but here's the interesting story though about how um, Cleveland got one of those AAFC teams. There was a taxi business owner in Cleveland. His name was Arthur McBride, and he was one of really eight original owners of the AAFC 
who wanted the Cleveland Browns to be the new charter members of the AAFC as well, and he really wanted to propose for the Cleveland Browns to be a part of that team in, in the All-American Football Conference League. So interestingly enough, though, once this eight-league team was established, he really started to get his team really up and going. His really his first big hire was was hiring Paul Brown, who a lot of people kind of talk about as really one of the big time first NFL head coaches, one of the real legends of the National Football League. He offered Brown the first job of the Cleveland Browns in 1946 after Paul Brown spent some time as the as a head coach of Ohio State and he also served as a head coach at Great Lakes Naval Academy when he was a head coach with them for a few years during the World War II year. So really interesting resume that Paul Brown had before he was hired in 1946. But really big thing, though, about Paul Brown, though, he really wanted to develop his team really using a lot of Ohio State players as well as some other really big players as well. Some of the really big guys they went ahead and got for their original team in 1946, just a few of them to um, to tell you here. Otto Graham, of course, the great quarterback that he is, Marion Motley, Dante Lavelli, Bill Willis, Frank, G- Frank Gatsky, Lou Groza, even Max Speedy, who was recently um, inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame last year. He also was a big Hall of Fame player for those Cleveland Browns teams in the mid to late 1940s. But interesting thing, though, here is that the Cleveland Browns, though, once this league, though, became of age in 1946, they really dominated for those first two years. In 1946 and 1947, like I said, they played in all four AAFC championship games from 46 to 49. But just to give you a sense, though, of how dominant they really were, in those first two years, they only lost three games in 14-game season. So think about it. You have 14-game season in 1946. You have a 14-game season in 1947. And, of course, you have the two championship games there. So when you really think about it, three losses in those 28 games. That's just a phenomenal, phenomenal start there by um, Paul Brown, really developing what the Cleveland Browns were going to be once they became the charter members of the National Football League when the AFC and the NFL merged in 1950. But here's the interesting note here, though. Actually, their first two championship game victories, some of those AAFC teams, they were also kind of similar names to um, Major League Baseball teams as well. They actually beat a team called the New York Yankees in the AAFC championship game in 1946 and 19. 19- 47. So pretty interesting there for um, the Cleveland Browns in those early years in the AAFC. But right before, though, the 1948 campaign, right before their perfect season became legend as it is in 1948, Brown still really wanted to upgrade his team, and he really got some really good key players from um, some of the other AAFC teams and even from NFL teams as well. We're going to talk a little bit about um, a few of them right now, actually. One of their big signings during the 1948 offseason was a um, safety named Tommy James, who was drafted by the Detroit Lions in 1947, but then he was released by the Lions, and he was basically picked up in free agency by the Cleveland Browns before the 48 season began. Another interesting um, offseason move they acquired was halfback Era Park Segan, and he was an unsigned draft pick from the NFL's Pittsburgh Steelers actually that same year as Tommy James was in 1947. He just didn't play in the NFL during the 47 year, but then he was picked up by the Cleveland Browns in 1948. And a few other really big players as well. They got halfback Doug Jones from the AFC's Brooklyn Dodgers, another former um, Major League Baseball team's name, but they also had a football team in the AAFC, and he also got two other really good players as well. He signed linebacker Alex Agase and defensive tackle Chubby Gregg with a trade with the AAFC's 
Chicago Rockets, who played actually at Chicago's Soldier Field along with the Chicago Bears during those years in the late 1940s. So really interesting um, offseason there by um, the Cleveland Browns in uh, 1948, really developing how their team was going to be reckoned with, even though they already had the talented team already, they still wanted to upgrade, and they really um, put through some really good players for them during that 1948 off season. So right before um, we talk about some of their um, key offensive and defensive statistics, I want to um, go over a few other really key players that they had as well on offense. Of course, we talked about quarterback Otto Graham. He was a five-time Pro Bowler and a seven-time All-Pro over the course of his career. But what's interesting here about Otto Graham, though, he was the fourth overall pick, though, in the 1944 NFL Draft. But now here's the deal, though. Because he was signed in 1944, he actually served in the military. He did not, of course, make an NFL roster because NFL veterans and even some NFL rookies were, of course, put into World War II. Otto Graham, of course, he did not play for really his first two years after he was drafted in the 44 NFL draft. So once NFL players came back after the war, once the AAFC was formed, this kind of allowed NFL draft picks who didn't want to go play in the NFL, kind of a new leash of saying, here's a new league for you. We're going to pick you up instead, and we're going to really see if you can help us win. And Otto Graham just turned out to be a phenomenal pickup there by um, Paul Brown in 1946 before the Browns' inaugural season. Another really big um, offensive player they had was fullback Marion Motley. He was a two-time rushing champion in his career. And a lot of people talk about this guy, though, as really being the groundbreaking color barrier of professional football at that time. Really one of the big first real true African-American football players in professional football, but he was a two-time rushing champion. He, he was a 1948 AAFC rushing champion, and he also was the NFL rushing champion, actually, in 1950. And interesting here from Motley, though, he was actually an undrafted free agent from the University of Nevada in 1946, so he wasn't drafted in 46 by either the NFL or the AAFC, but Paul Brown offered him a free agent contract, and he just turned out to be a bulldozer of a running back, and a really good one at that for his years with the Cleveland Browns that he dominated during that stretch. Another really big weapon the um, Cleveland Browns had on their offense was, of course, the um, Hall of Famer of just this season's um, class up here, Max Speedy here. He was a two-time Pro Bowler and a three-time All-Pro in his professional football career. He was a 15th round pick, though, in the 1942 NFL Draft, though, so kind of similar to what Otto Graham was. It was a late round pick, but of course he also served some time in the military as well, and he just never really got the chance to play in the NFL, so then he was picked up by Paul Brown once the AAFC was formed in 1946. Another wide receiver they had, Dante Lavelli. He was a three-time Pro Bowl selection in the National Football League. He was an undrafted free agent from actually Paul Brown's Ohio State Buckeyes in 1946 as well. So Paul Brown, like I'm going to kind of keep repeating here a little bit as well, I mean, he really kind of wanted some of those Ohio State players that he really developed and really worked with during his time at Ohio State, and he really struck gold with a lot of really big players that he was able to bring over once the war ended in 45. Another really big um, player they had as well. You can't leave out their kicker, Lou Groza, but here's the interesting thing, though, here is that Lou Groza also played offensive line as well. This was an era, of course, in professional football where you had players that played more than one position. Halfbacks would usually play like defensive back positions, probably offensive linemen would also be defensive linemen. Quarterbacks would probably maybe even be linebackers. You know, you just kind of went back and forth between those two positions here though but with Lou Groza though as a kicker and as a left tackle over the course of his incredible career he was a nine-time pro bowler and a four-time 
all pro. Now here's a really interesting statistic and um, note on Lou Groza here. The Cleveland Browns, of course, Cleveland Browns fans nowadays, they are dying, dying for this team to finally get back to the playoffs and hopefully finally win a championship here. But with Lou Groza though here, this is really interesting here. The, the Browns over the course of their NFL championships and their AFC championships from 1946 to 1965, right before Super Bowl I in 1966, Lou Groza actually was the only player of all eight Cleveland Browns championship teams. 1946 through 1950, they won five straight championships over those years. 1954 and 1955, they won the two NFL championships in that year. And then in 1964, their last NFL championship that year, Lou Groza was also a proud member of that squad in Cleveland Browns history. So a really phenomenal player for Lou Groza, but he's really, perhaps if they had AFC and NFL championship rings, to really think about it, he would probably actually have more championship rings than Tom Brady, if you could really picture that right now, because of course Tom Brady is a six-time Super Bowl champion, but with Lou Groza, though, he's an, he's an eight-time champion of the AFC and the National Football League, so just an insanely incredible career by Lou Groza with the Cleveland Browns during his time with them. Another really big, though, offensive lineman they had, though, for their 1948 squad was center Frank Gatsky. He was a three-time All-Pro selection with the Cleveland Browns, and he was an undrafted free agent, actually, from the University of Auburn in 1946 during that season as well. So, really good job for um, Paul Brown, really finding these key offensive guys. We're going to talk about a few of their key defensive players now here. Actually, one of their um, big defensive linemen they had in 19. 48, he was another impressive Hall of Famer, and similar to Marion Motley, he was also kind of a big groundbreaking color barrier player as well. Bill Willis, he was a three-time Pro Bowler and a three-time All-Pro during his professional football career, and he was an undrafted free agent, once again from Ohio State, in 1946 as well. Another really um, interesting um, defensive player that Paul Brown had was linebacker Lou Saban. Remember this, Bills fans, when we talked about their 1964 squad. Right before he got those really few head coaching jobs in the AFL, he was a linebacker for Paul Brown in the AFC, he, and he was a member of all four of those Cleveland Browns AFC champion years during 40, from 1946 to 1949. But he was a 10th-round draft pick, though, from Indiana in the 19. 19- 44 NFL draft, but of course he served his military time first, and then he was picked up by Paul Brown when the AFC formed. Another interesting um, defensive player they had was safety Cliff Lewis. He was a five-time AFC and NFL champion with the Cleveland Browns as well. He was a 21st round draft pick, though, from Duke University, actually, in the 1946 NFL draft. He was released and sent into free agency, but Paul Brown was able to pick him up before the 1946 season began, and he really turned into a pretty decent defensive back for Paul Brown during his professional career. Another really um, good defensive player as well, and he also served as a team's punter. Tom Colella was his name. He was a four-time AAFC and NFL champion as well with the um, Cleveland Browns during his years, but he was a seventh round draft pick, though, from Kinesis College in 1942. Now, really um, interesting New York College up there, but of course, similar, though, to um, as I said with the players, though, they of course served military time first, but then once they came back from the military and the AAFC was looking for these players, that's where they were able to really find these guys that were drafted in the NFL draft, but then just did not want to play in the NFL when they came back. They really wanted to see if they could get a new leash on playing football, and the AFC was the perfect place for them to really play as well. And another um, interesting player as well, we touched on him briefly when we talked about it, Tommy James, of course, that big signing that the um, Browns had in 1948, but he was a five-time 
AFC and NFL champion, actually, with the Cleveland Browns. So he, so he played with Cleveland from 1948 to 1950. He won those three championships with them, but then he actually then served as the team's defensive back in 54 and 55 when they won those NFL championships that year. So he had a really good career with the Cleveland Browns once they were able to pick him up after the Detroit Lions discarded him in, in 1947. And as for Tommy James, another big um, Ohio State um, player as well. He was a 17th round draft pick actually from Ohio State in 1947. So once again, just a really good job by Paul Brown really getting these guys and really forming what he was going to um, build on his philosophy once the Cleveland Browns became of age in the AFC and then of course once they merged into the NFL once the two leagues did merge in 1950. The birth of the Browns occurred in the aftermath of the Second World War. America wanted to relax following World War II and it was looking for some kind of a refreshing outlet. What better than pro football on Sunday afternoon? Cleveland's new club belonged to the fledgling All-America Football Conference. Their founding father was Paul Brown, an Ohio coaching icon who had served in the Navy. These men had come back from the service. They'd been in a war. This was a picnic after what they'd been through. The first team we had in 1946 was composed of players that Paul had coached before or played against. They didn't have a draft because I got my contract on Okinawa. Just getting back out of the service, uh, we were ready for whatever was out there as far as football was concerned. We knew that Paul was a very tough man and uh, very disciplined, that uh, we were ready for things like that because that's exactly what we had while we were in the service. Forged from the fires of war, Paul Brown and the team that was named for him came roaring out of the chute. With Otto Graham passing from the T formation, a then record crowd of over 60,000 saw the Browns begin their dynasty by annihilating the Miami Seahawks 44 to nothing. Over the next three years, the Browns dominated the league with stars like Graham, Motley, Willis, and Groza. In the span of four years, four championship flags flew in the Lake Erie breezes. In 1947, this post-war powerhouse totally outclassed their competition, losing only once. Over their four years in the new league, the Browns won an astonishing 52 games while losing only four. In the 1947 title game against New York, the punishing running of Marion Motley earned a 14-3 victory and a second straight title. In 1948, Cleveland was 15-0, the last perfect season until the Dolphins in 1972. Paul Brown's third consecutive title, this one over Buffalo, gave the city a pair of champions, for the Indians won the World Series. In 1949, paced by the passing of Graham to Dante Lavelli, they won their fourth straight championship. In one of our early sessions with Paul Brown, that he said he wanted to make the Cleveland Browns the New York Yankees of football, and he did. With four titles in as many years, Paul Brown now looked for a new challenge, the National Football League. Football was a black and white kind of a game. There was no color until Paul Brown. When you saw a Paul Brown team go on the field, it would be a reflection of Paul Brown totally. It would be Paul Brown, the creator, his images, his thoughts. Something always would be new. Paul Brown was a football god. For a time, he was all-powerful. In the decade following World War II, his creation went to 11 championship games in 12 seasons. Cleveland is overjoyed. The Browns are the champions of the world again. Yet Paul Brown was more than a coach. He reinvented a drab monochromatic game in bold, brilliant technicolor. At the time, he was Bill Gates. Paul Brown transformed the game from a physical exercise 
to an intellectual exercise. Lou Groza has the question, and Coach Paul has the answer. He wanted to control every single detail on the field. He wanted to know exactly what every player was going to do, and he wanted them to know exactly what was expected of them on every play. He was the first to put all his plays on paper and have players study them. It makes sense now, but at the time, it was really radical stuff. Here is a football team with a textbook. Players insert the mimeograph plays, and many hours are spent in study. He used film to study teams, to study his opponent, and no coach had done that before. When you'd go near one of his coaches, that's so all they were doing was turning that film and cutting it and splicing it. So when he talked to you, he'd tell you just about anything you'd done. We will be grading you during the regular season. It's easy to think somebody's doing a heck of a job, and then you get the pictures, and you find some guy that you hadn't thought much about is doing better than the guy you thought was doing a heck of a job. It's detailed, scientific study. The pictures never lie. He wanted to control everything. Then he'd have a messenger guard to run the play in. Then the next play, another guard would come in and the first guard would come out. That's how he got his offense in. Cleveland coach Paul Brown uses his signal calling shuttle system as he sends guard Chuck Knoll into the game with the play. Until Brown, quarterbacks had always called a team's plays in the huddle. Even though he had the finest passer of his era, Otto Graham, Brown called the plays himself. He was the first coach to put somebody upstairs with a line down to the sideline. The Browns leave nothing to chance in calling plays. Blanton Collier and Fritz Heisler observe the game from a vantage point high up in the stands. They relay their information to Weeb Eubank and Paul Brown on the bench phone. He wanted to be able to see and hear in real time what was working, what wasn't working. Did they blitz that time? Here we are today, and there isn't a team in football that doesn't do this. When he did it, it was his overreaching. Critics accused Brown of ruining football, of turning his players into pieces on a chessboard. Jim Brown set the new league record for yards gained rushing. Yet the inventions continued. The timed 40-yard dash, the draw play, Graham gives the ball to Motley. It's the draw play. The pocket to protect his quarterback. Graham again runs way back. In that pocket, throws a wide looking pass into the end zone. And one creation that literally changed the face of football. And we were playing the 49ers. Otto Graham had his face uh, cut up. Uh, the guy hit him with an elbow when he was down right under my feet in the sideline. Otto suffered a deep facial wound on this play one that required 15 stitches to close. These things uh, shouldn't happen in football. Paul Brown came up with a great big plastic thing about uh, two inches high, half inch thick. I couldn't breathe properly to bounce back, and I couldn't see. With a special face mask, and he was back in time to take the field. I said to the Riddell person that uh, handled our account, make me a uh, thing no bigger than the size of my little finger. Plastic, but with tensile strength enough to withstand the blow from the guy punching the man. He did patent it. There were royalties. They got paid for many years. Opposite. Jim, you know, would talk about their preparation. 95% of everything that we do from scouting players to breaking down film to on the field teaching, everybody's still basically doing the same thing. I'm primarily a teacher. And uh, I think a coach uh, has to be a teacher. The Browns spend more time in class and study rooms than they do on the practice field. They're They'd hear me lecture it. They had to draw the plays themselves. And then I'd put it on the board and do the diagram. And then we'd go out and just wrote it like you learn a golf swing. These were the laws of learning as I had read about them, and I tried to put them into my teaching. Paul Brown began each camp with a colorful lecture outlining his expectations. That was an annual event, and we had to record verbatim 
everything that he said. I am not to go into the moral aspect of marijuana because I don't know anything about it and uh, I'm talking about it in terms of our football. I do know this. If you're guilty of selling marijuana, it's 20 to 40 years imprisonment, believe it or not. If they were boozers or chasers or things of this nature, uh, I uh, wouldn't have them. On the night before games, be particularly careful that no visitors get into your hotel rooms. Gladhanders, relatives, gamblers, prostitutes, these people are just predators. We go to place to play football, and it's a serious proposition. Cleveland's franchise in the new All-America Football Conference offered to make him a minority owner and tossed in 15% of all profits. The Miracle Man demanded one more thing. My father chose the name Browns. I think it was in his mind, his team, and he was going to say so. I'm glad you're going to meet our boys. I'm very proud of them. You'll find they're a typical, high-class, clean-cut bunch of young businessmen. Brown enlisted the aid of former Naval Corpsman Otto Graham, Army Surgical Technician Lou Groza, and Infantryman Dante Lavelli, all future Hall of Famers. They'd been in a war. This was a picnic after what they'd been through. We didn't have all the high salaries and agents and unions that you have today. America, unfortunately, has missed the significance of Paul Brown on racial integration. After finishing up his career at Ohio State, Bill Willis coaches for a year at Kentucky State, a black school, and had no opportunity to play in the NFL. But after Paul Brown became the coach of the new league's Cleveland Browns, Willis wrote him a letter. Basically, he did not ask him for a chance to play or try out, but pretty much laid the foundation for the possibility. Paul Brown knew what he wanted. He knew how to uh, manipulate, if you will, to get things done. Paul actually had one of the sports writers talk to my father to insist that he stop by the training camp and try out for the team. A writer by the name of Paul Hornick. And he bet him a Stetson hat. He said, if you stop by the Cleveland Browns training camp in Bowling Green, Ohio, I'll bet you that Paul Brown will give you a tryout. The first day, Bill was so quick off the mark, and the Browns were just putting in the T formation. That was new, the snap to the quarterback under center. For the first time, he goes around the center. Next time, he goes around the other side. Then he goes under the center, then goes over top of the center and lands on Otto Graham's foot. And that's when Paul Brown said, okay, that's enough, stop, stop. <laughs> he didn't want to hurt his premier quarterback. Bill was a great player, and he had a firmness of character that was exceptional. My dad thought highly of him as a person, and my dad offered to sign him to a contract Three days after Willis signed that contract, another black player walked into Brown's camp. His name was Marion Motley, the same Marion Motley who played against Brown's team in high school and lined up for him in the Navy. Now, the six foot, one inch, nearly 240 pound, 26 year old Motley had left a job as a steel mill worker to come to camp, hoping to return to the game that seemed perfectly suited to his remarkable athletic gifts. Paul Brown originally put him on the squad to become Bill Willis's roommate, but he knew what he had in Mary Molly, but he didn't know it was gonna blow up as, as big as it did. Marion could do everything. Play linebacker, he could run, he was strong. In those days, you know, a guy playing 238, playing in the backfield, that was big. Even now, that's big. But the guy like that coming through the line, it scares you. He was a train wreck, and, and I was one of the guys that he wrecked. <laughs> We're scrimmaging, and I'm playing safety, and 
and Marion Motley busts through the line, a big hole, and now I'm the only thing between him and the goal line. And here's Motley coming at me. And I just put my head down and somehow managed to bring him down. He did have a slow start, but once he got going, you, you didn't want to be in his way. Jackie Robinson, they say, broke the barrier of this era. We came in in 46. Jackie come in 47. Branch Richard said, if Marion Motley and Bill Willis can play contact sports, Jackie can play non-contact. Paul Brown took the tack that you're one of the best football players, and I want you on my team. We're not talking about this. Paul never gave us a speech on integration. Uh, <laughs> he gave us speeches on excellence. I don't care whether you're white or black, Catholic, Protestant, Jew. Sex, you can be a communist, I guess. I can tell you that we will be successful in proportion to the caliber of people you are. In four years in the All-America Conference, they won the championship four times and even went through the 1948 campaign undefeated. Growing up in the segregated South, that Paul Brown had integrated his team meant a great deal. My dad was also a Presbyterian minister, and he was known to cut the sermons a little bit short sometime on Sunday so we could get home to watch the Cleveland Browns. Welcome back, everybody, to 100 Years of the NFL, A Historical Journey. We're going to continue with our look at the 1948 Browns' um, key offensive and defensive statistics now, and we're going to be touching on their um, schedule right after that as well. So let's go ahead and let's delve into um, their offensive statistics um, first here. So... In 1948, the Cleveland Browns, they had the second-ranked offense in the AAFC that year. Now, remember, like I said, the AAFC only had eight teams, so just consider that when I'm talking about these statistics with you. But they had the second-ranked offense in the AAFC that season. They were second-ranked in the passing department. They had 26 passing touchdowns that year, and they were third in rushing. They scored 25 rushing touchdowns that season as well and they really were one of the big play offenses during the AFC years they averaged six yards per play which was also second in the AFC during those years and once again kind of like I talked about with the, with the 2016 Patriots as well really stingy in the turnover department as well in 1948 even though kind of during those eras really interceptions were kind of really big back in those Days. But as for the Cleveland Browns, though, in 1948, they only committed 27 turnovers during the regular season that year, which was the fewest in the AAFC that year. They only lost 11 fumbles, and they only had 16 interceptions during the regular season. So really impressive job there by um, Otto Graham and Marion Motley, really limiting their turnovers that the um, offense just did not commit. Um, a whole lot of during that season that they had. They also they also led the AAFC, though, in first downs. They had 243 first downs during the 1948 season and really disciplined offense as well. They only had 77 penalties against them, which was the second fewest in the AAFC during that year in 48. And as for Otto Graham, just to get a basis on really how good his passer rating was, the Browns, they had an 85 Point zero passer rating in 1948, which was the third best in the league that season, and they averaged 27.8 points per game, which was the second most in the league that year as well. So really impressive job by that Cleveland Browns offense in 48. We're going to look at their um, defensive statistics here real quick. They had the number one ranked defense in the AAFC in 1948, kind of similar to the 1972 Dolphins during their perfect season that's that year as well. And the Browns, though, they were the second-ranked passing defense that year in 1948, but they were first in rushing that season. They only allowed 14 passing touchdowns and only 10 rushing touchdowns that year. Their passer rating, they gave up defensively. Really, really good job, but with these guys, they had a 49 Point one passer rating they allowed to opposing quarterbacks, which was the best in the AAFC that year. They only allowed 4.6 yards per play defensively that year, which was also best in the AAFC as well. The one weak spot, though, that the 
Um, Browns defense did have, though, in 1948, they did not really register a whole lot of turnovers. They did they did get 40 turnovers, though. They were, and that was only the fourth most in the AAFC during that season. They had 16 fumble recoveries and 27 interceptions. But kind of similar, though, to their offense, their defense, though, was very disciplined as well. They only had 76 penalties against them in 48, which was the third best in the AAFC that year, and they only allowed, they only allowed 171 first downs, which was also the fewest in the AFC, and really blow you away right here. 13.6 points per game is all they allowed during that 1948 perfect season for the Browns, which was also first in the AFC that year as well. So, really impressive job though by um, Paul Brown, and really instrumenting to his players of just you know how important the game was for them even though this was only really their third year of existence this this was a team that still really kind of had that veteran savvy among them they just really were very disciplined but at the same time though they really try to air it out and really trying to mix things up and that's what Paul Brown was he was really the first mad genius of professional football really just developing new schemes and every Thing. And, you know, his knowledge of the game, it really helped the Browns to a phenomenal start, really, for their first 10 years of their franchise's existence. And perhaps no season was better than their 1948 perfect season and just their third year of franchise existence for them that season. So what we're going to do here, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at the 1948 Cleveland Browns schedule here. Now, bear with me, though, as I... Um, go through their schedule here because the website that I have been using for all five teams so far is called Pro Football Reference if you want to check it out. It's just really interesting website where you can kind of see how players did in individual games or even individual seasons as well. But here's the, here's the deal though. During the AFC years, some games did not contain exact statistics and what I mean by exact statistics is kind of like yards stacks and things like that scoring wise they kept that pretty level they they, they they were able to really sort out you know how the touchdowns were scored and everything but as for yards and receptions and things like that that was kind of where it kind of got a little hazy and they really just weren't really sure how many were caught or received in individual games here. So what we're going to do here actually is I'm just going to kind of read off names and I'm going to kind of just see if you can kind of follow along with me as I just kind of really tell you like who scored the touchdowns and how the Browns defense performed during these games. So it won't be kind of as similar as to the first four teams that we've done, but see if you can bear with me here and then right at the end of this we'll be able, I'll be able to show you some of their highlights of their 19 48 season as well. So let's go ahead and let's delve into um, the 1948 um, Browns schedule here. So they did not have a game though in their um, week one game that year. So in week two of the 1948 season after they really had a week off to really rest and prepare their week two game, their first opponent they played against in 1948, there was a AFC team called the Los Angeles Dons. And the Browns beat them in the Week 2 game. Final score in this game was 19-14 to in this game. Otto Graham had a passing touchdown in this game. And he had a backup running back behind Marion Motley named Bill Bodeker. He also had a um, rushing touchdown in this game. And as for the Browns' defense, really good job against um, the Dons in this game. They forced four turnovers in, um, in their first game of the season. So a really good start for... Um, the Cleveland Browns in week two. Week three, really interesting here for the Cleveland Browns. They um, went to play the Buffalo Bills. That's right. The Buffalo Bills actually were an AAFC team before they were once again renamed once the AFL came of age during the 1960s. But as for the Browns in this um, week three game against the Bills, they won this game very convincingly. Final score in this game was 42-13 to in this game. Just a blowout here for the Cleveland Browns in this one. They had four rushing touchdowns 
in this game. And Otto Graham, during this game, he had two passing touchdowns in this game. One was to his um, Hall of Fame wide receiver, Mac Speedy, in this game. So a really um, convincing Week 3 victory against the Bills in that one. Week 4, the um, Browns played against the uh, Chicago Rockets in this game. Final score in this game was 28 to seven was the score in this game. Otto Graham he had three passing touchdowns in this game and had one rushing touchdown as well. So he was a one-man show in this game in the week four game. The defense the defense for the Browns in this game though really came alive in this one. They forced six turnovers against the Chicago Rockets in that week four win. Week five they once again played the um, Chicago Rockets. This time though it was back at Cleveland. Municipal Stadium in this game. Final score here, though, was a 21-10 to score in this Week 5 game. Otto Graham, once again, a really decent game from him. He had two passing touchdowns in this game, and Bill Bodeker had another um, touchdown in this game. And as for the Browns' defense, they forced three turnovers in that Week 5 win over the Chicago Rockets, completing their sweep against them. Week 6, the Browns... Um, then travel to play against the Baltimore Colts. Now, kind of similar circumstance here. Baltimore Colts, actually, they were, of course, renamed their team in the mid-1950s, but they had an AAFC team during those years. This week, six game, really tight game in this one. Browns won this game. Final score was 14-10 in this game. Otto Graham had one passing touchdown in this game. One of those passing touchdowns was to Dub Jones, who was another backup running back um, to Marion Motley dur during that season. And he also had a rushing touchdown in this game. And the Browns defense, once again, pretty decent job in this one. They forced two turnovers in, um, in that Week 6 game against the Baltimore Colts. Week 7, the, Br week seven, the Browns played against the Brooklyn Dodgers in this game, another MLB team that... Um, was kind of renamed as an AFC team as well. Browns won this game, though. 30-17 to was the score in this game. The Browns had three rushing touchdowns in this game, and their defense really, once again, had a really um, good game here. They forced three turnovers, and one of those was returned for a touchdown by a player named George Young. Now, this is not the George Young of the um, New York Giants, who was the general manager of their team at 1979 this was a different George Young so just not to get confused between the two of them it's not the same George Young but he had a return touchdown in that week seven win over um, the Brooklyn Dodgers week eight the Browns played to get played against the Buffalo Bills again this time once again at Municipal Stadium here Browns won this game 31 to 14 was a score in this one Otto Graham had two passing touchdowns in this game Marion Motley pitched in with a rushing touchdown in this game. And the Browns' defense, once again, two turnovers in this game and another impressive victory for the Cleveland Browns in their Week 8 victory. Week 9, the um, Browns played against the New York Yankees in this game. Once again, another MLB team also named as an AAFC team as well. This one more convincing in this one. Browns won this one. 35-7 to was the score in this game, Otto Graham, once again, the one-man machine in this one. He had four passing touchdowns in this game and one rushing touchdown. In the Browns' defense, same thing as their last game. They also forced two turnovers in a big Week 9 win for the Browns, which pushed their record to 8-0. and oh. And then after a Week 10 bye, they had, they, um, had the Week 11 game against the Baltimore Colts again in this one. They won this game. Final score was 28-7 in this game. Browns had three rushing touchdowns in this game, and Dub Jones accounted for one of those rushing touchdowns, and he also had a receiving touchdown in this game as well. And the Browns' defense also forced a turnover in that Week 11 win against the Baltimore Colts. Week 12, this was the, really their first really big test in this in this game here. They played against the San Francisco 49ers in this game. Final score in this one, another really tight one, only 14-7 to in this game. Only two rushing touchdowns for the Browns in this one. Otto Graham had one of them 
and Dub Jones had the other um, rushing touchdown as well. Browns defense, though, really came alive here, though, in this game. They forced six turnovers in a really tight game, and this game actually turned out to be pretty significant, actually, because both of these teams, actually, both um, the Browns and the 40, 49ers, they were really in a tight race in their division during the season, and this was really the, the first time that they would play against, and they would play a few weeks later, as we will get to in just a moment. But before um, I talk about their Week 13 game here, what I want to say is this, though. Their final four games for the Cleveland Browns during this stretch. This was a brutal stretch for the Cleveland Browns. Even though they, of course, you know, had the really good start here. They were 10-0, and really going into Week 13. But their final four regular season games were on the road. And this is going to be interesting here, though, as I'm going to point out to you right after this Week 13 game. And in that Week 13 game, the Browns defeated the New York Yankees in this one. Final score in this one was 34-21. to Three rushing touchdowns were scored in this game as well. Marion Motley had one of those um, rushing touchdowns in this game, and he also had a receiving touchdown in the game. And the Browns' defense, once again, three turnovers in this game. Really impressive victory for them, pushing their record to 11-0. and Now, Week 14, once again, played against the Los Angeles Dons in this in this game here. More convincing, though, than their um, Week 2 victory against them. They won this game 31-14 was the score in this game. Otto Graham had three passing touchdowns and one rushing touchdown this game, so almost the one-man machine in this one. And the Browns' defense forced another turnover in that Week 14 win. Now, here's the deal, though. Their Week 14 game, though, against the Los Angeles Dons, this actually came on a Thursday during the week. And now my hunch on sort of why, how this played out, it kind of almost relates back to that Week 10 game, which I kind of told you was a buy. So what I'm almost kind of thinking is either the Dons game got rained out or was their next game against the San Francisco 49ers. So basically they had two Week 14 games. They had a game against the Los Angeles Dons on a Thursday, and then basically three days later, they played against the San Francisco 49ers in this game. They won this one. Another really tight game, though, here. This one, the final score was 31-28 to in this game. Otto Graham, really great game in this one. He had four passing touchdowns in this game, and the Browns' defense once again came alive with four turnovers. But now here's the deal, though. In this game, even though the Browns did win this game and they went to 13 and 0, the San Francisco 49ers, if they had beaten the Cleveland Browns in in this game, both those teams actually would have been tied with a 12 and 1 record each going into the last week of the regular season. So think of this: if the 49ers had beaten the Browns in each of their games. It probably would have been the San Francisco 49ers of 1948 that could have almost had their chance at the perfect season if the Browns didn't beat them in the two times that they played against them during that season. So just to really give you how dominant the 49ers and the Browns were this 1948 season, it really proved how both those squads really would perform once they merged into the NFL in 1950. But then in the Browns' last um regular season game. They played against the Brooklyn Dodgers once again in this one. Another really um, strong victory here. Won this one 31-21 to to complete their 14-0 regular season record. Otto Graham, once again, three passing touchdowns in this game, and he also had a rushing touchdown in this game, and the Browns' defense forced two turnovers in this game as well. And, the, of course, the uh, AAFC um, championship game a really convincing victory here in this game they actually played the Buffalo Bills in the AAFC championship game here they blew them out though 49 to 7 was the final score in this game Otto Graham he had 118 yards passing in this game and he had a passing touchdown but he also did throw an interception but the really two big offensive players in this game it was Dub Jones and Marion Motley, both of them combined for 204 scrimmage yards in this game and scored five touchdowns 
between them. And the Browns' defense, once again, came alive big time in this one. They had, they had five interceptions in this game, actually. Saban, Lou Saban there, um, linebacker in the Bills, of course, future head coach, as we talked about with their 1964 squad. He had an interception return touchdown in this game. And George Young also had a return touchdown in this game as well to really complete the Browns 15-0 and regular season and championship season mark to really capitalize on only the second professional um, undefeated season in professional football history. Of course, they were the first ones to do it, and then 24 years later, after that, the 1972 Dolphins, of course, had their perfect season in the Super Bowl era. Here are a few Cleveland Browns highlights from the 1948 All-American Football Conference regular season. After starting the 1948 All-American Football Conference season with a 3-0 record, the Cleveland Browns hosted the 1-3 Chicago Rockets after a convincing 28-7 victory against them in the previous week at Chicago's Soldier Field. Let's get to the highlights of this Week 5 game between the Chicago Rockets and the Cleveland Browns. On the Browns' first offensive play of the game, Otto Graham under center here on this play, waiting for the snap from Gasky. He will take the snap. He is looking to throw under a little bit of pressure, but he's going to dump a nice screen pass here to Miriam Motley, and Motley will take this one out across the 20, the 25, the 30, and get tackled after just crossing the 35-yard line. So a good start for the Browns' offense, but two plays later, Otto Graham under center here on this play here. He will take the snap. He is looking to throw under pressure, and he is sacked by number 45, Ziggy Zarboski from Notre Dame, and that would give the ball to the Rockets' offense for their first possession of the game as quarterback Jesse Fridas from Santa Clara takes the snap, runs into his own man, and then evades pressure, and then fires downfield and completes a pass to his wide receiver, Eddie Prokop, who's got some open space, and can he go all the way yes he can touchdown rockets early seven to nothing lead as the game starts Otto Graham under center here for the browns second offensive possession of the game he hands this one off here to marion motley who picks up about a nice 11 12 yard gain for a first down to keep their drive going here and on the next play here Otto Graham under center here on this play he will take the snap he is looking to throw and he will fire and complete a pass here to dub jones to keep this impressive drive going and then two plays later Graham again under center here on this play he's gonna take the snap he will look to throw under a little bit of pressure evades the rush though and then fires downfield for Max Speedy pass is incomplete but a pass interference flag is thrown on Chuck Fennenbach you see him arguing with the with the official there he is not gonna win that call at all. Later in the drive it's now third down and long here for the Browns offense as Graham going to take the snap and he will hand this one off to Bill Bodeker and he gets tackled by Pete LaManna from Boston University after about a five yard gain. Then on fourth down instead of sending Lou Groza out onto the field for a field goal, Browns decide to go for it here as Otto Graham going to take the snap. He will fake the handoff Gets out of the camera angle for a moment and then fires into the end zone, but the pass is ruled incomplete. He was out of the end zone, and the Rockets take over on downs. On the Rockets' next possession here, this is Frias with a mishandled handoff, and the Browns' defense recovers the football, and the Browns' offense would take over from there. On the next play after that, this is a pitch here outside of Cliff Lewis, who has some nice open space here, but this run would be called back, though, due to an illegal formation penalty on the Browns offense so the refs would move the ball back and the Browns would replay the down here with Otto Graham under center here on this play and he will take the snap from Gasky here and he will hand this one off to Miriam Motley who picks up a nice game before getting cut down at about the 12 yard line. Later in the drive though it's now second down and goal here for the Browns offense as they look to punch this one in. Otto Graham with a handoff here to Motley and he gets stuffed after no gain on second down, on third down and goal from the two, Graham again under center here on this play. He hands this one off again to Motley, and once again, the Rockets defense holds. And we get, go ahead to another fourth down play here for the Browns offense. Otto Graham under center here on this play, waiting for the snap, and he takes the snap and he pitches it outside of Bill Bodeker, and a nice tackle by Dewey Proctor from the University of Furman turns the ball over on downs and gives the ball to the Rockets offense. 
Later in the first quarter, though, this is Fridas, though, with a handoff here to Harry Clark from West Virginia, and he picks up about a gain of three or four yards on his first touch of the game. And then on the next play here, Fridas under center, he will take the snap, and he is looking to throw, and he's going to fire a nice short pass here to Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch before he gets tackled by Tommy James as the Rockets keep the drive going here. On the next play, this is a pitch here to Dewey Proctor, who finds some space here on the left side, and he picks up a nice gain before being tackled by Weldon Humble for the Browns defense. Then on the next play here, Fridas again under center here. He's going to take the snap. He will look to throw with great pocket protection. He will fire a pass downfield, and that's caught again by Elroy Hirsch, and that sets him up at the 12-yard line. And later in the drive, they will try and attempt a field goal attempt, but the ball is mishandled, and the Browns defense snuffs it out as the Rockets turn the ball over and the Browns take over possession. Later in the second quarter, though, this is Otto Graham under center here on this drive. He's going to take the snap. He will look to throw on this play, and he will fire and complete a pass here to Dante Lavelli before he gets tackled by Chuck Fennenbach from UCLA. On the next play here, this is a handoff here to Marion Motley, and he picks up a nice gain here before being tackled by Bob Perina from the University of Princeton. On the next play, Graham again under center here for the Browns offense. He will take the snap this time and he will hand this one off to Dub Jones who gets a nice six yard game here for a Browns first down. And then on the next play here, Graham again under center here on this play. He will take the snap from Gatsky here and he looks to throw and he will be under pressure here and he is sacked by George Bernhard from the University of Illinois. Next, two plays later for the Browns offense. Graham under center here on this play. He's going to take the snap. He will look to throw this time, and he's going to fire downfield. And this pass is intercepted by Bob Perina, and he has some open space here. Makes a cut inside before he gets tackled at the 11-yard line, and that would result in a Jim McCarthy field goal that gets the Rockets a 10 to nothing lead. Next Browns drive though, this is a handoff here to Dub Jones before getting cut down by Fred Negus from the University of Michigan. Then on the next play here, Graham again under center, he will hand this one off to Marion Modley and he gets cut down by Joe Ruiz from the University of Notre Dame on that short rush. Then on the next play here, this is another handoff here to Dub Jones and he picks up a nice five yard gain for a Browns first down. And then two plays later, Otto Graham under center here on this play. He takes the snap, he is looking to throw, and he fires a bomb downfield looking for Speedy, and Speedy's got it inside the 10, and then he gets tripped up after just crossing the five yard line. The ref marks him down at the four, and the Browns set up first and goal here on this play with Otto Graham under center here. He hands this one off to Marion Motley, and he gets cut down by Bob Perina after about a two yard gain which sets up a second down and goal here for Otto Graham and the Browns offense here as Graham will take the snap here and he's going to look to throw and this a incomplete pass for Marion Motley it's ruled as a dead ball even though the Rockets do recover it but it sets up a third down and goal from the two as Otto Graham is again under center here on this play winning for the snap from Gatsky he takes the snap here, and he's going to look to throw under pressure, and he will throw this one out of the end zone. Pass is ruled incomplete, even though a great effort by Dante Lavelli to try and get that ball. But unfortunately, it now sets, sets up a fourth down and goal here for the Browns' offense as Otto Graham is again under center here, and he will hand this one off to Marion Motley. And once again, Motley is stopped short, but a penalty flag is thrown for offsides on the Rockets defense. So now here we go again, fourth down and goal. And Otto Graham is gonna take this one actually and try and sneak it in. And he is ruled short as the Rockets take a 10 to nothing lead into the half. We move to the third quarter now as Jesse Fridas is under center here on this play. He will take the snap and he is looking to throw, avoids pressure from Chet Adams and then gets sacked by Bill Willis from Ohio State. So the Browns defense trying to step up here in the second half. On the next play, Fridas is going to take the snap. He looks to throw, and this pass is caught by Bob Livingstone before he gets tackled by Tom Colella on that play there. And then on the next play here, Fridas is going to take the snap. He is looking to throw, and he fires and completes another pass here to his receiver, Eddie Prokop, before he gets tackled 
by Tommy James. So the Rockets moving the ball well here. But then on the next play here, Frias looking to throw. And this pass is intercepted by Lou Saban. And he picks up a nice couple of yards. And that sets up the Browns offense in great field position here for their first drive of the second half. On their first play here, this is going to be a handoff to Dub Jones, and he picks up a nice game before being tackled by Pete LaManna on his first rush of the second half. On the next play here, Otto Graham under center here, waiting for the snap from Gasky. He takes the snap this time. He is looking to throw, and he fires and completes a pass to Horace Gillum, and Pete LaManna also in on that tackle on that play. But then on the very next play here, Otto Graham going to take the snap this time. He is looking to throw with great protection from his offensive line. He fires into the end zone, and the pass is caught by Bill Bodeker, and he scores the Browns' first touchdown in the game. They now trail 10-7. to On the Rockets' next drive here, this is Frias going to take the snap. He is looking to throw, and this is almost a busted play here, and he gets sacked by Tony Adamley on the Browns' defense, and that gives the ball back to the Browns' offense here. And on this play here, Otto Graham going to take the snap. Great protection once again. And he's going to fire a pass downfield. And this pass is caught by Dub Jones. And he walks into the end zone for a touchdown. The Browns take a 14-10 lead. Later in the third quarter here, this is Otto Graham and the Browns' offense driving for another score here. As Otto Graham's looking to throw. And he fires a pass along the sidelines. And this is a great catch by Max Speedy, but Pete LaManna complains to the official. He thinks Speedy was out of bounds, but the ref signals a great catch for Max Speedy as the Browns drive continues. Otto Graham on two plays later here. He's going to take the snap. He is looking to throw, and he fires another pass, and this is caught by Horace Gillum, and he gets tackled by Chuck Fennenbach on that play there. Three plays later, Otto Graham and the Browns driving the ball effectively here. He is looking to throw and he fires into the right corner and the pass is ruled incomplete for Dub Jones, but a pass interference flag is thrown and that would set up a Bill Bodeker touchdown. On the Rockets next drive here, this is gonna be a handoff here to Harry Clark and he finds some nice open space here as the Rockets trying to get some momentum back into this game here. On the next play here, Fridas under center here on this play. He will take the snap. He is looking to throw, and he is under pressure, and he is sacked by John Yoniker as this Browns defense has really stepped up here in the second half, and they are looking to close this game out really well. On the next play here, this is going to be a handoff here to Clark, and he picks up some nice space here on this play, but the play is nullified due to a false start on the Rockets' offense. Two plays later, Fridas again under center here on this play, waiting for the snap, and he takes the snap this time, and he is going to look to throw again under a little bit of pressure, but somehow he will fire a pass, and this pass is caught by Bob Jensen from Iowa State, and he gets tackled by Cliff Lewis, and that sets up a first down. But three plays later, Fridas under pressure on this play, and somehow he will get this pass off. The pass is ruled incomplete, and that would set up a fourth down here for the Rockets offense. And then on fourth down here, this is Fridas going to take the snap here and he is going to look to throw and somehow he's going to get this pass off to Floyd Simmons from Notre Dame, but he gets tackled by Weldon Humble as the Rockets turn the ball over on downs. Rockets trying to get one more drive here right before the end of the game as Fridas going to hand this one off here to Jim Mello from Notre Dame and he picks up some yards before being tackled by Chet Adams and Lou Saban. Two plays later, Fridas here going to take the snap. He is looking to throw, and he fires and completes a pass here to Jim McCarthy, who gets tackled by Cliff Lewis. Two plays later, Fridas again under center here. He's going to take the snap. He will look to throw, and again, he is sacked by John Yoniker as this Browns defense keeps making big plays here. And then on the next play here, backup quarterback Tom Ferris comes into the game here for a play due to Frias' injury on the previous play. He is going to look to throw on this play, and he is sacked by George Young. And this Browns defense really starting to get pressure on both quarterbacks here for the Rockets. And then on the final play of the game here, Frias is going to look to throw here, and he fires a pass downfield, and the pass is intercepted by Cliff Lewis. And Lewis would end the game for the Browns as the Browns win this game by the score of 21-10. Fast forward two months later, the undefeated 12-0 Cleveland Browns face off against the 11-1 San Francisco 49ers in a big game to determine the AAFC Western Division champion 
just three days after Thanksgiving. You will see these highlights along with some ESPN music and no commentary.
Welcome back, everybody, to 100 Years of the NFL, a historical journey. We're going to continue, actually, with our look at the 1948 Cleveland Browns key offensive and defensive statistics of some of their individual players during the 1948 All-American Football Conference season after I was able to show you two of their um, regular season highlights of their Week 4 game against the Chicago Rockets and that very pivotal um, game against the 49ers, their, their, their second game against the 49ers to be exact, during the regular season as well. And then right at the end, um, after talking about the individual players, we'll take a look at their um, 1948 All-American Football Conference Championship game against the Buffalo Bills. I'll share with you some highlights of that game as well. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at some of their um, key offensive statistics and we'll start with their players here first our first player we'll actually talk about is quarterback Otto Graham who had a really good year in 1948 he passed for just a shade over 2700 yards during the 1948 AAFC season which actually was one of the better prolific passers during the four years of the All-American Football Conference but in 1948 though Otto Graham he threw 25 passing touchdowns to only 15 interceptions so a Pretty good um, season there for Otto Graham, and he also rushed for six touchdowns during the regular season as well. Of course, leading the Browns to their 14 and 0 mark during the regular season, and of course, perfecting it in the AAAFC Championship win that they accomplished against the Buffalo Bills. One of his really good um, running backs that he had, but behind him. Of course, we talked about Miriam Motley. We're going to touch on him a little bit later, but he also had kind of almost a running back by committee for what Otto Graham had during that 1948 season. One of his better halfbacks was named Edgar Jones. He had 693 scrimmage yards during the 1948 season, and he had 10 total touchdowns during the regular season, both rushing and receiving combined. So a pretty good year there for um, Edgar Jones in that department and for Edgar Jones really interesting um, note about him he was a 19th round draft pick in the 1942 NFL draft now of course like I said with Otto Graham and the rest of these guys even though he was drafted in the 1942 NFL draft he served in the military first but then once coming out of the military it, he, he did not want to sign with an NFL team and once the AAFC was formed that allowed NFL players that option of either playing for another league or going back to the NFL. And in Edgar Jones's case, he turned out to be a pretty good running back for the um, Browns during their years in the All-American Football Conference. Another um, interesting halfback they had was Bill Bodeker. He he had a pretty decent season as well. He had 491 scrimmage yards during the 1948 season, and he scored five touchdowns rushing and receiving combined during the 48th season. He was an undrafted free agent, though, from DePaul University, though, in 1946. So a really interesting find there by Paul Brown, finding Bill Bodeker from DePaul in that 1946 year before they had their perfect season in 1948, just three years later. Another halfback he had was name was Bob Cowan. He had 364 scrimmage yards during the regular season as well. And like Bodeker, he also scored five total touchdowns, both rushing and receiving combined during the 48 season. And as for Cohen, he was a 12th round draft pick, though, from Indiana University in 1945 NFL draft during that year. And of course, like I said, you know, kind of, you know, doing the military experience first, but then choosing the All-American Football Conference instead of the NFL and then the last um, running back in there running back by committee that the Browns had at 48 was Dub Jones and you know he kind of was one of the few Browns players who not only performed well in the AAFC but then also performed pretty well once um, the AAFC teams then went into the National Football League both the Browns and the 49ers like I said earlier were the only two teams in are still the only two teams to come out from the AAFC and still be in the NFL nowadays. But as for Dub Jones, though, he had 268 scrimmage yards, though, during the 1948 season, and he scored three total touchdowns 
for the Browns offense that year, both rushing and receiving combined in that department. But as for Jones, though, really interesting note about Dub Jones, though, here. He was a second overall pick in the 1946 NFL draft from LSU, and that is, of course, a pretty high mark once you kind of figure about the NFL. You almost think, like, you know, once you get a first-round pick like that, you almost think NFL right from the get-go. But as for Dub Jones, though, he actually played his first few years in the AAFC, not on the Cleveland Browns. The Browns actually signed Dub Jones during the 1948 offseason to be a part of their team. And, you know, he really didn't rise to that second overall pick status as second overall picks sometimes do nowadays. But as for Dub Jones, though, once he kind of got into the Cleveland Browns system, he really showed why he was considered one of the top prospects in the 1946 NFL Draft, not only during the 1948 season, showing some sparks of it, but once he was a part of the Browns teams that were from 1950 on, once they emerged into the National Football League, he really became a really big-time player for the Browns during those years that they had in the National Football League. And then, of course, we talked about their um, fullback, Marion Motley. Really great year for him in 1948, though. He was really the leader of that running game that um, the Browns had. They had he, Motley, Motley, he had 964 rushing yards during the 1948 AAFC season, which actually led that conference during the season as well. Only scored five rushing touchdowns, though, but he also was a pretty decent receiver as well, he, as we saw a little bit in the highlights as well. He had only 192 receiving yards, though, during the regular season and only scored two receiving touchdowns, but still really doing his part very, very well and really breaking that color barrier, as I mentioned earlier, along with Bill Willis being as dominant of their players as they were back in the 40s when Jackie Robinson and the rest of them broke the color barriers in baseball, of course, Bill Willis and Marion Motley were the two ones to do it in professional football and both doing it in a really big way for the Cleveland Browns. And also, Marion Motley, he was also the Browns' primary kick returner, actually, that year as well. He had 14 kick returns, but not so much good on the average, but still very reliable in the, kick, in the special teams department for the Browns during the 48 campaign. And as for... Um, Otto Graham's two main wide receivers, both Max Speedy and Dante Lavelli. we got to mention them a little bit. Max Speedy, in 1948, he actually led the All-American Football Conference with 58 receptions that year for 816 receiving yards and scored four touchdowns to earn all pro honors for the AAFC, along with his quarterback, Otto Graham, and alongside his fullback, Marion Modley, all three of them earned all pro honors for their efforts during the 1948 season. And as for his wide receiver next to him, Dante Lavelli, of course, Speedy and Lavelli in the Hall of Fame. Now, Lavelli, though, he only had 463 receiving yards, though, during the regular season, but he also scored five receiving touchdowns during the regular season as well. But here's the deal, though, about Lavelli, and kind of like what I said about that running back by committee thing. One of the reasons why they kind of had to adjust to that is actually Dante Lavelli, he suffered a preseason injury during the Browns' only two preseason games that they had that year, and he missed six of their regular season games due to that injury. He ended up coming back and performing pretty well to his standards, but the problem was, though, they really weren't firing on all cylinders because not everybody on that offense was as healthy as what Paul Brown would have expected, but still, very, but still, they adjusted their offensive schemes very, very well to accomplish that 14-0 mark during the regular season, and of course, capping it off in the AFC Championship against the Bills. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at some of their um, key defensive players they, that they had during the 1948 season. We'll start out with their defensive line, kind of what I mentioned earlier about Bill Willis and Marion Motley being the two color barriers to break them down. And, of course, Bill Willis was almost a two-way player. He was an offensive lineman and a defensive lineman. But he also had two other really good defensive linemen um, 
with him in that defensive line unit. One of those guys was Weldon Humble, who had an interception, actually, as a defensive lineman in 1948. He was a 24th round draft pick, though, from the University of Louisiana in 1943, though. So a really late, late pick in that 1943 NFL draft, but of course, served his time in the military, and then, of course, made his decision to play in the All-American Football Conference rather than the NFL, and he had some pretty good years with uh, the Cleveland Browns, as we did see as well in some of their regular season highlights that I was able to show you earlier um, in our broadcast. Another pretty decent defensive lineman that they had was John Yoniker. We kind of touched him a little bit in their um, highlights as well. He also had an interception alongside um, Weldon Humble in 19. 19- 48 as well, but he was a he was the ninth overall pick though in the 1945 NFL Draft from the University of Notre Dame. So, pretty high regards there for um, John Yoniker, really being one of the top prospects during that 1945 NFL Draft. But of course, similar to Weldon Humble, deciding to play in the AAFC rather than the NFL. And another um, pretty interesting um, sort of front seven guy that. Um, the Browns had during their um, 1948 season. Era Parsegan. Really interesting in here. The great Notre Dame head coach at that as he was later. But of course he actually began his career actually as a professional football player before becoming a major, major big time success story in um, the college football ranks. But as for um, Parsegan though, he also had an interception during the 1948 All-American football conference season and he also scored two offensive touchdowns for the Cleveland Browns during that season as well so pretty interesting there from um Parsegan but as for him though he was a 13th round draft pick though from Miami of Ohio in 1947 actually by the NFL's Pittsburgh Steelers but the Steelers didn't offer him a contract though after that season so he actually spent the 1947 NFL season almost as a free agent and then once the Browns picked him up in 48, they ended up getting a pretty decent season out of Parsegan before he, of course, became the legend that he became in the college football rank. So a pretty interesting um, story there in the um, Cleveland Browns um, defense. And, of course, we also talked about another great um, coaching legacy that was established here in another Great front seven guy hit their linebacker, Lou Saban. He had five interceptions in 1948 for the Cleveland Browns defense that year, and he also had an interception return in the AAFC championship game against the Buffalo Bills during that game as well. But as for Lou Saban, as I kind of talked about with Parsegan a little bit, Lou Saban, we talked about him with the 1964 Buffalo Bills. So you kind of see this trend that Paul Brown really had the influence on and really influencing some of the great college football and future NFL and AFL head coaches that he really became a true admirer for that everybody just sort of developed their own philosophies but of course they all based it back to what Paul Brown did for them starting their professional careers and Paul Brown just an incredible incredible man to learn from for all these great future coaches that, of course, began their careers as players under him during um, the AAFC years. And then, of course, once they merged into the NFL in 1950. Another um, pretty um, interesting defensive player that they had was Tom Colella. We talked about him being their punter, but he was also their defensive back as well. He had, Colella, he only had two interceptions in 1948, but he was kind of a multi-purpose kind of player a little bit here for the Browns. He also had an offensive touchdown for the Browns during um, the 1948 season. And, of course, I talked about with him punting. He only had 49 punts, though, during the 1948 season, and he only averaged 35 yards per punt. So nothing really too major in that department for Colella. But he also had a playoff interception during that AAFC championship game against the Bills. So kind of the multi-purpose player that Tom Colella was for the Cleveland Browns in 1948, but still doing his job as he's supposed to, and a really decent player at that for the Browns that year. And then, of course, we talked about their safety, Tommy James. He had four interceptions 
during the 1948 season, and he also had two interceptions in that championship game against the Bills. And as for James, you know, of course, being discarded by the Detroit Lions, like I was saying earlier, almost given a second chance by the Cleveland Browns, and he took advantage of that really big time, of course, later in the NFL years, but of course really made a big splash in 1948 with four interceptions and really kind of being that young defensive presence behind a pretty veteran experienced squad for the Browns in 1948. And of course their last really big piece as well was that was another good defensive player named Cliff Lewis. We talked about him a little bit. He, he had nine interceptions though during the 19. 19- 48 AAFC season, which was the second most in the conference during that year. So a really great ball hawk in that Cleveland Browns secondary, but he also was a pretty good punt returner, though, as well. He led the AAFC with 26 punt returns in 1948, and he also even had a passing touchdown as well in 48. So you kind of see these multi-purpose players that the Browns were able to utilize in so many different formations and everything and that's kind of the way professional football was played back then there were more than one position that players played for and of course it you know was the style of NFL back then because you know they just didn't have as many players as they do now with 52 man rosters back then you almost had almost 40 man rosters or even less than that but still though I mean an impressive impressive offense and defense that Paul Brown had during that 1948 perfect season for the Cleveland Browns and then of course their last player you can't of course forget the toe Lou Groza for what he accomplished but a pretty weak year though for him in 1948 this is going to surprise you a little bit though he really struggled on field goals during this season he only made he only made eight of 19 field goals so under 50 percent for a Hall of Fame kicker really early in his career you know of course you know you kind of say of course different era and almost different things like that but you kind of scratch your head and you kind of say eight of 19 that's not a hall of fame kicker is it but of course he of course improved once he became the great kicker that he really became during the 50s and then of course during his final years in the 60s as well but what's interesting here though Groza had a pretty big leg though for a kicker though even though he was also an offensive lineman but his longest field goal he made that year was from 53 yards out so a pretty decent leg that Lou Groza had even though for early in his career still very very impressive but he really did his damage though on extra points though he was 51 of 52 on extra points during the 48 season and and he ended up with 75 points scored during the 19. 48 season so a pretty decent year for Lou Groza even though he did struggle with field goals but still a very good start for him for his Hall of Fame career. In the 1948 All-American Football Conference Championship game the undefeated 14-0 Cleveland Browns took on the Buffalo Bills to determine the league champion. Early in the first quarter, Autogram under center here on this play. He will take the snap from Gatsky, and he is looking to throw under a little bit of pressure, but he will fire and complete a pass here to Edgar Jones, who then is tackled by Carl Chouette from the University of Marquette. So a good first offensive play there for the Browns offense. Three plays later, Autogram again under center here, waiting for the snap from Gatsky. He takes the snap. He is looking to throw under a little bit of pressure, but he's going to dump a nice screen pass here to Miriam Motley and look at this effort here by Motley as he will break one tackle and then he's going to drag one, two, three, four, maybe five Bills defenders before he is finally ruled down. So a great individual effort there by Miriam Motley on that play. Next play after that, Graham again under center here on this play with Dub Jones in motion here. Graham going to take the snap and he is looking to throw with great pocket protection and he's going to fire a pass complete to Dub Jones here before being tackled by Bob Smith from the University of Tulsa. But then the Bills defense would stiffen and give the ball to the Bills offense with quarterback George Ratterman here taking the snap. He is looking to throw under pressure. He fires a pass downfield and it's intercepted by Tommy James here and Tommy James is going to get a key block here and then he will break the tackle and then he is tackled just around the 20 yard line by Chet Muttrin from Xavier University. So a great play there by Tommy James giving the ball back to the Browns offense. And later in that drive, this is a handoff here to Mario Motley. He will take this one down 
to the three yard line here and this will set up a second down and goal from the three as Graham is going to take the snap here and he will hand this one off to Edgar Jones who plows in three yards for a touchdown and the Browns take an early seven to nothing lead. We move to the second quarter here. Graham again under center here on this play. He will take the snap and he is looking to throw and he will fire and complete a pass here to Dante Lavelli but then watch Lavelli trying to pitch it to one of his teammates. That is a live football and it's Carl Chouette for the Bills defense that dives on top of it and gives the ball back to the Bills offense. But then watch what happens here on the Bills next offensive possession. Bryderman going to take the snap. He will pitch this one to Rex Bumgarner and he loses the football. It was not punched out or anything and it's scooped up by George Young and he takes it into the end zone for a Browns touchdown as the Browns take a 14 to nothing lead. Later in the second quarter, Graham again under center here driving for the Browns. Graham going to take the snap and he will look to throw on this play and he fires a nice pass here to Max Speedy who then is pushed out of bounds by Chick Maggioli from Indiana University. Browns moving the Ball effectively again here as Graham again under center here on this play. He will take the snap and he is looking to throw and he's going to fire a nice pass here complete to Horace Gillum who then is tackled by Chick Maggioli again after just crossing the 50 yard line. The next play right here, this is going to be a slow motion run here by Miriam Motley as Otto Graham going to take the snap under center here from Frank Gatsky. But watch how many tackles Miriam Motley will break on this play here after he evades that first man. He's going to break one, two, three. And once again, it's going to take four Bills defenders to take Miriam Motley to the ground. Another great individual effort there by Motley. But then right before halftime, though, Otto Graham trying to get one more playoff, trying to get a score in before halftime. Graham going to look to throw on this play, and he's going to fire a pass downfield, looking for Max Speedy, and it's intercepted by Chig Maggioli. Speedy pushes him out of bounds, and the Browns take a 14 to nothing lead into the half. We move to the third quarter here. Otto Graham again under center here as the Browns continue driving on this one, and he's going to pitch this one to Miriam Motley, and look at this effort by Motley as he will evade a tackler, but then he is eventually tackled here by Marty Comer from the University of Tulane at about the 17-yard line. Next play after that, Graham again under center here on this play, winning for the snap from Gatsky. He will take the snap this time, and he is looking to throw, and this is going to be almost like a busted screen pass play, and this is caught here by Dante Lavelli with some open space as he crosses the 20, the 15, and then he is finally tackled by number 47, John Kissel, from Boston College as the Browns keep moving the football. Otto Graham again under center here on this next play from scrimmage and he will look to throw on this play here and he is going to complete a pass here to Edgar Jones and he walks in for a Browns touchdown. They are now ahead 21 to nothing. Later in the third quarter, Browns again driving here as Otto Graham going to take the snap here and he is looking to throw and he will fire and complete a pass here to Max Speedy who breaks a tackle and they'll break another one but then he is tackled by number 37 Vin Scott from Notre Dame. Browns driving move, moving the ball much effectively here in the second half here as Otto Graham going to take the snap this time he will hand this one off to Edgar Jones who plows two three yards on this play but then on the very next play here Graham again under center here on this play waiting for the snap from Gasky. he will hand this one off to Motley and look at this effort by Motley as he uses his speed and he breaks a 29 yard touchdown run and the Browns now lead 28 to nothing next Bills offensive drive here though this is quarterback Jim Still who takes over for George Ratterman here Jim Still out of West Virginia here taking the snap looking to throw under a little bit of pressure but he's going to fire a wobbler of a pass downfield, and this is somehow caught by Rex Baumgartner, who gets eventually tackled by Lou Saban. Bill's trying to finally move the ball for the first time down the field on this drive. Jim still again under center here, taking the snap, and he looks to throw with great pocket protection this time, and he is still looking to throw, and he's going to fire a nice pass here that is caught by Bill O'Connor from the University of Notre Dame, and he is tackled at the 10-yard line. Next Bills offensive play here though, Jim still again under center here on this play, waiting for the snap and he takes it and he is going to look into the end zone and this is a phenomenal catch by Al Baldwin from the University of Arkansas and the Browns now lead 28-7. But in the fourth quarter though, 
the Browns drive it here, and this is going to be a handoff here to Marion Motley, and look at this effort once again by Motley in the open field, using his speed and using his power, and he breaks a 31-yard touchdown run, and the Browns now take a 35-7 lead. Next Bills offensive possession here, though. Jim still again under center here on this play and he will take the snap and he is looking to throw and he fires a short pass here to Bill O'Connor who gets eventually tackled by Cliff Lewis on the Browns defense. Next play here for the Bills offense still again under center here on this play and he will take the snap this time and he looks to throw and he's going to overthrow Bill O'Connor and it's intercepted again by Tommy James and Tommy James trying to break a tackle here he will break another one but then he is tackled by Ed King from Boston College but gives the ball back to the Browns offense next Browns offensive possession here in the fourth quarter as they try and wrap this game up here Autogram again under center here on this play and he's gonna take the snap this time and he will hand this one off to Ollie Klein and he's got a lot of open space here with great blocking from the offensive line but then he is gonna get clothesline here by Don Schneider from the University of Pennsylvania. So a good play there though, again, by the Browns offense. Graham again under center here on this play. He will take the snap this time. He's gonna fake a handoff, but then he's gonna pitch this one outside here to Marion Modley. And Marion Modley again with open space here. He will cross the 30, the 25, the 20, before eventually being pushed out of bounds again by Don Schneider right around the 15 yard line. Later in the drive, Autogram gonna, again under center, he's going to fake the pitch and then he'll pitch this one outside to Marion Motley and he's got open space here and he will walk this one into the end zone for another Browns touchdown taking a 42-7 lead. Bills once again here trying to drive, trying to get one more score before the end of the game. Still going to take the snap this time. He will fake a handoff here, and he's going to fire a pass downfield here, which is again caught by Bill O'Connor, and he will try and evade a tackler right here. And then he's going to get tackled by Tony Adamley from Ohio State on the Browns defense. But then on the very next play here, Jim's still going to take the snap once again and he is looking to throw, looking to throw on this play and he will fire a pass and this one is intercepted by Lou Saban and Lou Saban will end the game for the Browns here as he returns this one for a touchdown and the Cleveland Browns win the championship game by the score of 49-7. About this, you know, Cleveland, phenomenal, perfect season that they had in 1948. Really, the first professional football team to accomplish that once the playoff era began in 1932. A very impressive year by the Cleveland Browns as being the first undefeated team, and then of course being being the 1972 Dolphins as the other undefeated team in Super Bowl history. But how does this 1948 Browns team, though, compare to the 1978 Pittsburgh Steelers? That's going to be our topic for our next broadcast in the AFC North. We'll delve into the Pittsburgh Steelers dynasty years. As, as I have said um, many times on our um, broadcast series of, of the 100 years of the NFL A Historical Journey, video podcast. If any of you ever have an idea or a story that you want me to talk about, your favorite team, your favorite player, or anything like that, feel free to um, place a comment on my YouTube channel or Facebook or even Twitter account, and I'll be sure to look into that for you guys as we continue with the AFC North. And of course, we'll continue through all eight divisions, hopefully, and you'll be able to see some of your greatest championship teams of all time in this phenomenal podcast journey that I thank all of you so far for really joining me on this experience as of course not only is it great for me to show you guys some of the great footage of your greatest teams of all time it's also a very powerful learning experience for me myself because just because you know I'm just such a fan of NFL history and all that so of course just keep your ideas coming and of course I'll see if I can get your team or players in at some point during this 100 years of the NFL A Historical Journey podcast. So, But once again, though, I hope everyone has a great night, and I hope all of you really continue to stay safe during these difficult times. CBS Sports thanks you for watching this presentation of the National Football League.